My name is Ramon Cernuda, and I want to welcome you to our gallery, Cernuda Arte, and to this special exhibition titled Black Art Matters, a group show of 13 Afro-Cuban artists from the modernist and the contemporary period. Welcome. We will today talk and uh, take a walk around the 100 years of uh, Cuban art from the 1920s to actually 2020. But before we embark in this adventure, let us talk a little bit about the origins of Cuban painting. Cuban painting started around the year 1800. That is, Cuban-born artists who were painting in Cuba for specifically that very limited market that existed in the colony. In 1817, the population of Cuba was about 530,000 people, according to the census of la that year, of which 250,000 were whites and Chinese. They were counted as whites. The rest, over 300,000 people, were of Afro origin. Half of them were free blacks and the other half were slaves. So when the movement of Cuban art begins in the 1800s, the population was about evenly split between blacks and whites. And coincidentally, the artistic and paintings movement that begins in the island precisely around that time is represented by two artists, one white descendant of Spanish people and the other one Afro-Cuban, descendants of African slaves that have been brought to the island. The first artist was Nicolás de la Escalera. Nicolás de la Escalera is an artist that uh, dedicated his career to painting religious subject matter. He uh, mostly worked for the Catholic Church and the pious and devout families of the colony. The other artist in this moment of origins of Cuban painting is a black artist, Vicente Escobar. Vicente Escobar, and here we have three works that represent his body of work, dedicated his career to painting portraits. Vicente Escobar painted the aristocratic families and the families of the government of the colonial power in Cuba. We have uh, a very interesting story about this founder of Cuban paintings, this uh, Afro-Cuban artist. Vicente Escobar was in the early 19th century, the early 1800s, awarded a scholarship to go to Spain, Italy, and France, and to finally settle and further his studies in the San Fernando Academy in Madrid. He was such a distinguished artist at that time that the crown of Spain named him Pintor de Cámara, painter of the court of Spain, the only Cuban artist ever to be awarded that incredible recognition in the 19th century, especially being an Afro-Cuban. Um, afterwards, he returned to Cuba and he continued producing excellent work, as you can see from these three important portraits of uh, military people of the island's government. I was telling you about Vicente Escobar and how Queen Maria Cristina in 1827 awards Escobar with this special distinction. It was so important that it changed Escobar's market and it changed his life, really. Vicente Escobar was born black. He was registered in the Book of Pardos, the, libro, the book that uh, was used to register births of people of color. And when he died, he was listed in the death, the book of whites that died. So Vicente Escobar was really our first Michael Jackson. He was the person that was born black in Cuba 
and dyed white. This was possible because of the recognition and the prestige that he received from the Spanish crown. For example, let's look at this painting by Vicente Escobar. It's a work from 1828, and it is uh, a painting, a portrait of one of the most successful merchants in Cuba of that period. His name, Agustin de las Heras y Carazo. Uh, he uses the gold to signify the economic of power of this uh, person and he signs of course in the dedication and in the back of the work. Uh, we go on into this work, a portrait of one of the captain generals of Cuba, the uh, uh, portrait of Nicolas de Mai y Romo from 1822. Again, a man of power, it's symbolized by the sword and the cane and the medals. And here we have the vice director of the government in Cuba in those days, the portrait of Don Jose Verdaguer y Carbonell. He was a trusted person of the Spanish court. In 1830, he was sent by the crown to supervise the activities of the local government. Three excellent examples of works by Vicente Escobar. So, as I said, Vicente Escobar was awarded the honor of being a painter of the court. The same recognition that was received by Diego Velázquez 170 years earlier. It placed him in a totally different category from all other colonial artists. It elevated him to the most important artist of Cuba in the 19th century. So now we will start talking about this exhibition properly. The art that was produced in Cuba from the 1920s to the 2020, 100 years, a century of art by modern and contemporary Afro-Cuban artists. These artists brought to Cuba a revolutionary way of doing art. They broke with the traditional styles of the European classic paintings. They broke with the academy in Havana that taught them how to paint in a very conservative way. And they also brought in ideas that were original, that were unique to the country. Some ideas that were revolutionary in social relations, race relations, and uh, the value and importance of the simple people of the island. We will look at the modernism in Cuba and we will start with the number one artist of all times, the Afro-Cuban artist Wifredo Lam, of which we have a representation of a group of works here. Uh, we have these two pastels on paper. We have these two one-of-a-kind ceramics, uh, painted ceramics by the artist. We have three canvases that represent Wifredo Lam in this exhibition. Wifredo Lam was born in 1902 and he died in 1982. He came from a very poor family in Sagua La Grande and the neighbors, when they realized that the child was immensely talented, raised funds to give him the monies to be able to go study in Havana at the San Alejandro Academy, which was then the University of the Arts in Cuba. Lam arrived as a teenager in Havana and studied at San Alejandro. He distinguished himself so much that in 1923, at age 21, he was awarded a scholarship to go study in Spain, in Madrid. And uh, he was assigned to the then director of uh, uh, art and head curator of the Museo del Prado in Madrid to be his teacher and his mentor. Uh, Mr. Sotomayor was the uh, professor of uh, Wifredo Lam 
during those early years of uh, continued development as an artist. In 1937, after having produced a very significant body of work in Spain, Lamb decided that it was time to leave. The Civil War had become very, very uh, combative, and uh, he moved to Barcelona first, getting closer to the frontier with France, and later crossed into France in 1938. At that age, Wifredo Lam went directly to see Pablo Picasso, whom he much admired with a letter of introduction, and Picasso immediately identified the immense talent of Wifredo Lam, invited him to his home, befriended him, and introduced him to the top artists of the School of Paris. 1938, in Paris, Wifredo Lam was a success, an instant success. Pablo Picasso introduced Lam to André Breton, the head of the Surrealist movement, to Pierre Loeb, a major gallerist in the, in the city of Paris, and to various other prominent artists, Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, and facilitated Lamb's connections with the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and specifically its director, Alfred Barr. Wifredo Lamb had jumped into the big leagues. He was already at that moment recognized as a significant modernist artist. And he was the first African descendant artist to be accepted at the highest levels of the international modernist art movement. Lamb's mature work was all about Afro-Cuban symbols. It was all about his identity as a person of mixed race. Lamb was considered to be, and once said to be, part Cartesian and part savage. And uh, as for his work, one paragraph, a direct quote from the artist that I think represents his social and ethnic intentions is this. With regards to life, modern painting is a revolutionary activity. We need art in order to transform the world into a more humane place where mankind can live in liberty." End of quote. Wifredo Lamb's sales records at auction in the international arena have broken once and again records and the numbers are going up and up and up. Currently, his auction records is at $9,600,000. Uh, from there, Wifredo Lamb continued to uh, gather immense recognition and success. During the war, he came back to Cuba, and after the war, he returned to Europe, where he did very important work throughout his lifetime, with over 100 museum exhibitions, with over 500 group exhibitions. Wifredo Lam is certainly the most prominent artist of Cuba of all times, another Afro-Cuban that wins that distinction. Teodoro Ramos Blanco, virtually forgotten artist, born in 1902, died in 1972. Teodoro Ramos Blanco was a member of that first generation of Cuban modernist artists. And to be more specific, I want to say that that generation was composed of basically 13 names, 12 men, one woman. So we're talking of a small group of revolutionary artists who brought a different kind of art to the island. In the case of Teodoro Ramos Blanco, his work was about black pride, the uh, movement that affirmed the identity of his ethnicity as something that he carried with dignity. You have works by Teodoro Ramos Blanco exhibited in Havana in the late 1920s. He, was, uh, he attended the San Alejandro Academy, he graduated from San Alejandro, and he was sent on a trip with a scholarship to Europe 
to further his studies. In the early 1930s, Ramos Blanco connected with the Harlem Renaissance movement, and he was the only Cuban artist to exhibit with the Harlem Renaissance artists in New York and Chicago. His works then were so, so sought out and appreciated that Nelson Rockefeller and the Rockefeller family acquired works by Ramos Blanco, as well as the Museum of Modern Art New York and the NAACP. Ramos Blanco came back to Cuba in the mid 30s and settled into a position of teaching at the San Alejandro Academy. There are very few of these works that deal with African pride, Afro-Cuban pride, and we here have two examples. We have uh, Head of a Man by Teodoro Ramos Blanco from 1932, and then we have the woman, uh, sculpture of a woman. These are wooden sculptures, one of a kind wooden sculpture. And now we continue with the second generation of the modernist artists of uh, Afro-Cuba in the early 20th century. The first generation, as I said before, was born towards the end of the 19th century and the very first decade of the 20th century. The second generation are, uh, is composed of artists that were born in the 1910s all the way to the 1920s, the late 1920s. So uh, we have here a very interesting artist. His name is Roberto Diago. He was born in 1920 and he died. He was actually uh, killed in 1955. His short career of 35 years in, of life and only maybe 15 of artistic production is very limited. So it is not easy to see works by this artist, Roberto Diago, also known as Diago the Elder. In the tradition of the Bruegel family, we in Afro-Cuban art have also a family of artists. And we will talk about the grandson of this artist later in this conversation. So Roberto Diago is an artist that again depicts issues of his race and his ethnicity you can clearly see the influence of Pablo Picasso in his body of work, especially in his figurative uh, area of his work. Here we have two excellent examples of the works of Roberto Diago. Uh, the work on this side is Woman, a very important work where you can clearly see influences of Pablo Picasso. And here we have another painting by Roberto Diago, a woman sitting in a sofa. Uber Solis was born in 1923 and she passed in 1974. She was a uh, black woman of uh, limited uh, means. She came from a very poor family. Um, many of the members of her family were house workers and uh, she was a self-taught artist. Uber Solis had uh, the help of Domingo Ravenet, uh, a major artist of the first generation of the Vanguardia movement, who was her mentor. Uber Solis painted uh, works, limited number of which uh, were about the uh, life, everyday life of Afro-Cubans in their daily activities, expressing happiness, joy, uh, a, uh, a freedom to be able to conduct themselves uh, with absolute uh, normality. We have here two works by Uber Solis that are representative of her body of work. These are watercolors. We have uh, a woman uh, tending to a farm, and then we have a farm actually, uh, that uh, is also one of the uh, favorite subject matters of Uber Solis, farm life. Uber exhibited in the Soviet Union in 1946. She also exhibited in Mexico and in the United States and Cuba. 
Uh, she did develop a body of work that had to do with the carnival scenes and also family life. Um, and she was exhibited at the National Museum in Havana on various occasions. After she passed, her family donated over 100 artworks to the Cuban National Museum. Her works are very limited and they're not easy to find. Now we will visit works by another one of the second generation modernist artists in Cuba. This sculpture is the better known and internationally re renowned uh, sculptor of Cuba, Agustin Cárdenas. Agustin Cárdenas was born in 1927 and he passed in 2001. Uh, he went to San Alejandro Academy in Havana from 1943 to 1949. Cárdenas uh, exhibited immediately after graduating with the group of the Eleven. As these younger artists of this second generation were known, many of them worked in the abstract movement of Cuban paintings, and Cárdenas, as a surrealist sculptor, was uh, very distinguished even in those early days. Agustin Cárdenas, in 1955, is awarded a scholarship by the Cuban government to further his studies and uh, push and promote his career in Europe. And he went to Paris. Upon arrival in Paris, he connected almost immediately with André Breton and the Surrealist movement that uh, embraced him. And he exhibited with the Surrealists on many occasions in Paris and in other capitals of Europe. Cárdenas had the good sense of becoming directly related to major galleries in various Europe European capitals. He was working with uh, Bulakia, he was working with La Busola, he was working with Le Point Cardenal, he was working with major other galleries such as Du Dragon, and those galleries supported his career by providing him the funds that he needed to do uh, sculptures in wood, in marble, and also in bronze. We have here three excellent examples of the Cárdenas production that we will show to you uh, as uh, good representations of his work. So Cárdenas is considered our number one sculpture in Cuban art. Uh, he produced thousands of works in stone, marble, wood, and bronze. And currently his uh, record, sales record at auction, is in the $500,000. He is collected in Europe and the United States of America, Latin America, in top collections throughout the world. Fellow sculptor, Roberto Estopiñan, also from Matanzas, who occasionally exhibited with Cárdenas, was born in 1921 and died in 2015. He lived a very long life. Uh, unfortunately uh, for Estopiñan, the market has not awarded him with the recognition that we feel he deserves. His exquisite draftsmanship, his very careful production of bronzes, uh, marbles, and also works on uh, delicate uh, stones uh, is very well uh, acknowledged, but not rewarded in monetary uh, recognition by the market. Estopiñan was uh, a very old school sculpture, one that would produce one of a kind bronzes and not series. So that is also a thing that we should recognize and uh, applaud uh, for Estopiñan. Here we have two sculptures uh, of the series of the romantic series of female torsos and uh, a drawing of the female torsos also. Another Cuban, Afro-Cuban artist from this second generation of modernists is Guido Ginas. He was born in 1923 and he died in 2005. Guido Ginas was educated in Cuba 
mostly self-taught, and joined the group of the Eleven, a group of abstract artists who started exhibiting in Havana in the very early 1950s, clearly influenced by the abstract movement of paintings of the New York School, uh, the uh, abstract expressionist movement. Guido Yinas was a very important artist of that movement. And in the 1950s, he was distinguished as one of the top non-figurative artists in Cuba. In the 1960s, he went into exile in Paris, where he lived the rest of his life. His organic abstractions, and especially his black painting series, blend the gestural qualities of abstract expressionism with veiled references to the mysteries of Afro-Cuban rituals and the symbolism of the Abaqua coded signs. Totally immersed in his profession, Ginas left us a well-populated oeuvre and a career distinguished by the integrity to his beliefs. Angela Costa Leon, one of my favorite artists. He was born in 1930 and he died in 1964. Actually, he committed suicide. Angel Acosta Leon, as a young man, went to the University of Havana and later to San Alejandro Academy, where he graduated from painting, a very distinguished student of his promotion. Uh, in the 1950s, from 57 on, he started exhibiting in Havana. Some of his uh, first shows were presented together with Alfredo Sosa Bravo, his dear friend. In 1959, Acosta Leon was uh, recognized by art critics as a talent, a major talent of his generation. And after his graduation in San Alejandro, he was awarded a scholarship to go to Paris and further his studies. He left Cuba in 59 to study in Paris, and he lived in Paris until 1964. Angel Acosta Leon was recognized as one of the top surrealist artists of Cuban art. In his 34, short life of 34 years, he was uh, received many accolades and awards. In uh, Europe, he exhibited at Galleria Dant, and he also exhibited in Paris. He was supported by Mata, among other uh, mentors that he had. In 1964, Angel Acosta Leon was virtually forced to return to Cuba, and on his trip back to the island in a ship, he committed suicide. Nicolás Guillén Landrián, born in 1938, the nephew of the national poet of Cuba, Nicolás Guillén Batista, had a very polyphacetic artistic career. He was both an award filmmaker and a celebrated painter. As a filmmaker, he is known for his experimental and critical documentaries produced during the early years of the Cuban Revolution. In 1968, Nicolásito, as he was formerly called, threw his lot with artists and writers who defied the Castro government by opposing governmental repression and limitations in culture. That year, his film, Cofe Arabiga, produced in Cuba, became a symbol of rebellion. He dared ridicule the figure of the maximum leader, Fidel Castro, on the screen while the song, The Fool on the Hill, by the Beatles, played in the background. Shortly afterwards, he was expelled from the Cuban Institute of Cinematography. From 1970 to 1989, he was repeatedly, repeatedly jailed, arrested, and institutionalized in mental institutions. As part of the abuse that he was subjected to, he was submitted to eight treatments of electroshock therapy without sedation for his political deviations. Nicolás' other artistic passion was painting. 
He resorted to the brushes when the cameras were taken away. As a painter, he developed a colorful, tropical, and spontaneous expressionistic style that often searched for and attempted to decipher the meaning of facial expressions and absurd scenarios. Interestingly, when Nicolas came into exile, he was interviewed in radio by the very famous journalist, Agustin Tamargo. And as part of that interview, the Afro-Cuban Nicolás Guillén was asked about race relations in Miami and if he felt some rejection because of his race. And he responded, why should I? I am blonde with blue eyes. In 1989, Nicolás arrives to Miami in exile. And shortly after arriving, he displays a major one-person retrospective of his works at the, at the Cuban Museum of Miami, which was a major success. He exhibited over 50 paintings and they all went to private collections on opening night. He was an instant success in the Cuban-American community. Belki Sayon, born in 1967, passed away in 1999. She was an anthropological painter and printmaker who dwelled in the anecdotes and the stories of the secret society of the Abaqua, and a society of blacks, some free, other slaves, that was founded in Cuba in the early 19th century. Something very interesting about her work is how she defies that all-male characteristic of the Abaquas by inserting herself, a symbol of herself, in her Colographies and other prints. Uh, she uses the color white to identify her presence in her composition. This society, the Abaqua, was somewhat similar to the Freemasonry founded in Cuba, also in the early 19th century, the Cuban chapters, of course. A rising star in the international contemporary community. Belki Sayon has received many uh, recognitions and uh, won artist exhibitions in her short life and afterwards. Tomás Eson, born in 1963, is one of the most painterly artists of this contemporary movement. Tomás Eson enjoys the pleasure of painting the chalking, the repugnant, the offensive, always denying the viewer the peaceful recreation of and the enjoyment of his art. His images have caused great scandal and controversy in Cuba, from where he was tactfully prodded to leave in 1990. His paintings are grotesque. His creatures are monstrous, bestial, as if humankind had been drained of any goodness, the dark prevails in the extremely talented Afro-Cuban artist who recently was conferred the Cintas Award and is currently exhibiting his first solo museum presentation at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Miami. Juan Roberto Diago, born in 1971 and educated at San Alejandro Academy, the grandson of Roberto Diago, also known as Diago the Younger. He is a painter and sculptor of extraordinary talent, whose whole career and artistic creation has been dedicated to depict and denounce the unjust and discriminatory race relations that affect Afro-Cubans, African diaspora descendants, historically and currently in Cuba, and in other parts of the world. Racism, poverty, marginalization, and abuse are common themes in his art. He has been extended international acclaim and has exhibited his works at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. in 2017, at the Harvard University Ethelbert Cooper Gallery, Massachusetts, 
and at the Low Museum Coral Gables in 2019. Professor Alejandro de la Puente has recently published the book, Diago, the Pasts of this Afro-Cuban Present, a highly recommended reading. Juan Roberto Diago is one of the most distinguished younger members of the Cuban, Afro-Cuban modernist movement. Manuel Mendive, born in 1944, is considered by many one of the most important contemporary artists of the Afro-Cuban movement today. He certainly is the only one that has dedicated his career totally to the creation and disclosure of a religious iconography that affirms and explains the spiritual values, mysteries, and sacred rites of Santeria, a body of beliefs that conform the syncretism of the devotional Yoruba peoples masked with Catholic identities essential for the religious survival of the African slaves in the 19th century. What Fra Angelico was to Christianity in the early Renaissance, Mendive has been to Santeria, a religion that is practiced by over 15% of the population in the island. His international recognition is unquestionable. Museum ex exhibit his works all over the Americas, Europe, and Africa. Multiple books, critical essays, and journalistic articles have been written and published. You will find Mendive profusely in YouTube if you so desire. In closing, we want to affirm the importance of Afro-Cubans in the origins and development of Cuban art. We have seen in the 19th century the most prestigious artist to be an Afro-Cuban, Vicente Escobar. We have seen in the 20th century the most recognized international artist being an Afro-Cuban in Wifredo Lam and the most recognized sculptor of the early modernist movement being an Afro-Cuban in Agustin Cárdenas. And we see strong representations of Afro-Cubans in the modern and contemporary movements such as Roberto Diago, Juan Roberto Diago, and Manuel Mendive. Cuban art without the contribution of Afro-Cubans would not be what it is today and would not have the recognition that it has today. Thank you.